Hello, my name is Christopher Thomas. Some of you might know me from the Confessional Bibliology group on Facebook or the Confessional Bibliology website. And today, this is the first of the Confessional Bibliology Roundtable, in which we'll have various speakers come in and talk on textual issues that are of interest to the confessional view of Scripture. Today, we have Pastor Christian McShaffrey of Pottasolo's Church, Dr. Jeffrey Riddle, and Puyan Masharhi, who's over in England right now. The way this will work is McSha or Christian McChaffrey will give his presentation. It'll be on John 118 and the textual variants found there in the critical text and in the Texas Receptus, along with the consequences of them. At the end of this, all three men will engage in a roundtable over the questions that we've received before this presentation began. Now, I do have a form that some of you may have seen that allows questions to be asked as the presentation is ongoing. And if we have the time, because this is only going to go for an hour and 15 minutes, we'll go ahead and put those up as well. And hopefully we'll get some good conversations, some good information on this. I believe we will. All right, I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to Christian. Just a second here. And... Very good. Thank you, Chris. It's good to be invited to present on John 118 today. I've prepared material of 20 to 30 minutes on the verse, and I hope it'll generate some good discussion and thought. Let's begin by hearing God's holy word from John chapter 1 and verse 18. Theon udes heorica papata, ha monogenes uias, ha on es ton kalpon tu patros, Ekenos exegesita. First, a literal translation. God, no one has ever seen. The only begotten Son, who, being in the bosom of the Father, the same has declared or made known. The authorized version reads, No man hath seen God at any time. The only begotten Son, who is in the bosom of the Father, he hath declared him. Throughout Christian history, John 1.18 has stood as a classic proof text for the begottenness or the eternal generation of Jesus Christ. He has been worshipped and confessed as the only begotten Son of God since the earliest of times. This confession was officially adopted in creedal form in 381 at the Council of Constantinople. It is also echoed in most, if not all, Protestant confessions. Jesus Christ is the only begotten Son of God. Now, sadly, modern Bible translations have confused many on this essential point of orthodoxy, and they will probably continue to do so until the modern racket of consumer-driven Bible publishing is brought to a final end. As for John 1, verse 18, there are two Greek words which reveal the importance of Christological orthodoxy, but also the irresponsibility, I think, of modern translators. The first word is monogenes, and the second is huios. My aim in this video is, first of all, to explain why the Greek word monogenes is best translated as only begotten, because I'm convinced that establishing that as the proper translation actually helps settle the textual debate, but we'll come back to that in due time. So first, monogenes defined. The word monogenes is, of course, a Greek word. It's a compound word. The first part, mono, comes from the root monos, which means one, only, soul, singular. It's really simple enough. And this word, its essential meaning, has even well established itself into our own English language. I mean, anyone who's ever worked with audio equipment knows that mono means sound from a single source as opposed to stereo. And other examples would include English words like monotheist, only one God, monologue, only one person speaking, monopoly, only one business controlling supply chains. And the same usage is seen in the New Testament. Its base meaning is essentially the same. It means only. Here are a few examples from the New Testament to establish the fact. Matthew chapter 4, verse 4. Man shall not live by bread alone, mono. 
Matthew 4, verse 10, speaking of God, him only, mono, shalt thou serve. Luke 5, verse 21, who can forgive sins but God alone, monos. So I think the conclusion is clear enough. Mono means only or alone. The second part of the word, genes, comes from the root verb genao, or the noun genos, which are words related to derivation, origin, birth, family, race, etc. And again, the basic meaning of this word has also carried over into our own language, with some of the more obvious examples being the science of genetics or the online hobby of studying your own genealogy. So a most basic wooden rendering of the word would be single descent, or more smoothly, only begotten. That's what monogenes means. And that, of course, has been the accepted translation since the time of Tyndale, who was a master of bringing biblical phrases like this directly into our English language, even coining new terms like Jehovah, Passover, atonement, scapegoat, mercy seat, monogenes, it clearly means and has always meant only begotten. But today's critics now challenge, they actually reject that classic rendering, suggesting that the root meaning of monogenes is actually more about kind or class. But it needs to be said that even if that's true, the translation that has been traditionally received still stands. Because according to scripture, you know, that paradigm, each according to its own kind, it tells us that kinds and classes are still connected to birth or descent within a particular species. But nevertheless, as I said, the modern versions have abandoned this compound phrase, only begotten, and have instead adopted a translation that communicates really only half of the word. Take, for example, John 3.16, in the English Standard Version, we read, For God so loved the world that he gave his only son. Now, it's a decent translation, but it's at best an under-translation because the inspired word is not mono, but monogenes. So we could then ponder the question, why? Why do modern versions under-translate one of the inspired words of the living God? Now here, some are going to suggest that it's an anti-Christ conspiracy intended to soften the Bible's teaching on Christology, but that does seem to be an overstatement to me because the ESV does allow the word begotten to stand in other verses. One example would be Psalm 2, verse 7. The Lord said to me, that is, Jehovah speaking to the Son, you are my Son, today I have begotten you. And other examples in the ESV would be Acts 13.33, Hebrews 1, verse 5, Hebrews 5, and verse 5. So modern translators are not necessarily against the begottenness of the Son. They're just against translating monogenes as only begotten. And if you look at the lexicon or the dictionaries and the commentaries, you'll see that modern scholars even engage in etymological gymnastics in order to defend that under translation. I mean, they act as if the presence or absence of a single noon indicates a transition to a different root word altogether. But I don't want to count nuns today. Let me rather explain what I think is the real reason that only begotten is now opposed as a translation. And that'll shift our conversation from translation, of course, to text. Weos or theos, that is the question. Now, in my introduction, I said there were two words in John 1.18 that demonstrate the irresponsibility of modern translation. And having considered the most natural translation of monogenes, we need now to look at the second word, which is weos, or son. Now, the word son does not appear here in most modern versions of the Bible because they are not translated from the text of the Greek New Testament that was historically used by and received by the Church of Jesus Christ. Instead, these translators um, based their text on the reconstructed text of the critics. It was produced in the late 19th century. It's known as the critical text, and it does not present the Bible reader here with a monogenes weos, an only begotten son, but rather it presents the reader with a monogenes theos, an only begotten God. 
Now, I've heard and I've seen the fact that many Christians hear that, at least upon first hearing, as a seeming proof of the divinity of Christ. But the concept of an only begotten God is actually anything but Christian, and it needs to be said. Those who are familiar with the pagan classics already know this. An only begotten God, what in the world is that? Well, that's the Greek goddess Athena which was begotten out of the head of Zeus. Uh, or maybe it's the half-god Hercules, who was begotten of Zeus through a mortal woman. Begotten gods are a very common thing in ancient pagan mythology. On the other hand, having one true god with an eternally begotten son who is consubstantial with the father, that is a distinctly Christian doctrine. Again, it is a doctrine that has been believed and confessed by the church for centuries. So why then the debate? And we all know, I trust, it's due to a textual variant. Some ancient manuscripts read monogenes weos, only begotten son. Others read monogenes theos, only begotten God. There are also less significant variants that involve the presence or the absence of the definite article there, but they do not ultimately impact the meaning of the verse or even the debate here. I'm personally convinced that the weos reading is indeed authentic, and I'd like to defend that claim by offering a brief survey of the internal and external evidence, as well as offering some theological considerations. So first, the internal evidence. The word monogenes and the phrase monogenes weos are favorites to the Apostle John or what we would call typically Yohanin. And every Bible reader knows this. Think about the examples. John 1, verse 14. We beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. John 1, 18, the only begotten Son, which is in the bosom of the Father. John 3, 16, for God so loved the world, that he gave his only begotten Son. John 3, 18, He that believeth not is condemned already, because he hath not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. 1 John chapter 4, verse 9, In this was manifested the love of God toward us, because that God sent his only begotten Son into the world. Main point being, if John did write monogenes theos here in John 1.18, it would be the exception, a new term, something he had never written before and would never write again. And we could say that's indeed possible, but not necessarily likely. Another piece of internal evidence is the logic of the verse itself. No man hath seen God at any time. The only begotten Son, which is in the bosom of the Father, he hath declared him. Follow the thought. No one has seen God at any time. God is invisible. My children used to recite this from the children's catechism. God is a spirit and has not a body like men. The first person, therefore, mentioned in this verse is clearly Jehovah, or God the Father. The second person in the verse is the one who reveals or makes known or declares the first, and this person is obviously visible, for we read in verse 14, the word was made flesh and dwelt among us. And again, he did this with a distinct purpose, to make known, to reveal, to declare that which no man has ever seen, being the Father. The logical and theological construct of this verse only works with Father and Son. If the word son is changed to God, it immediately becomes unintelligible. Think of it. No man has seen God, but God who is in the bosom of God has declared God. What in the world kind of sense does that make? It makes no sense at all to the Trinitarian Christian, but it does make sense, perfect sense, to Arians, both modern and ancient, who deny the doctrine of the Holy Trinity. One example would be the Jehovah's Witnesses, they're quite happy with the proposed theos reading here because it strengthens their theological-driven mistranslation of John 1.1, and the word was a God. 
So that is some of the internal evidence. Consider also some of the external evidence. The variant reading monogenes theos, only begotten God, is attested, and we cannot deny that, in some very early manuscripts. Codex Vaticanus has it, so does P66 and P75, and these witnesses are ancient, admittedly. If oldest is your best, if that's your paradigm, if that's what makes your text critical methodology so meaningful, then this is probably your reading. You have an only begotten God. But here, I would say not so fast, because the evidence for monogenes weos is almost as ancient as the evidence against it. Both readings trace back to the second century AD. So how do we know which is authentic? Can we even know? And I do think we can because it's abundantly clear which reading was accepted by the church. That is, by the people of God who actually lived at the time, as well as those who lived after. The vast majority of later unseals and minuscules support the Weos reading. The majority of lectionaries support it. The majority of ancient versions support it. Just look at the apparatus in the Novum Testamentum and you will see that the evidence in favor of Weos, son, is in fact overwhelming. Even Metzger's committee faced division on this verse due to the preponderance of evidence in favor of the received reading. But let me come back to this important, but it's often neglected and ignored, this important concept of actual usage in the church. Twice as many church fathers have weos than theos, and one of the church fathers, Eusebius of Caesarea, actually alerts us to a possible explanation for how the variant reading theos arose in the first place. Writing of heretics that had modified the text of scripture in order to defend their false doctrines, Eusebius wrote, quote, they have boldly falsified the sacred scriptures. They have boldly laid their hands upon the divine scriptures, alleging that they have corrected them. They cannot deny the commission of the crime, since the copies have been written by their own hands. End quote. Eusebius, Ecclesiastical History, Book 5, Chapter 28. Now, there have been many heretical groups throughout history that have falsified and sought to correct the sacred scripture. Eusebius mentioned several of them by name in his writings, but there's one group that deserves particular attention when weighing the variant in John 118, and that group would be the Valentinian Gnostics. Here we have to remember that during the first few centuries of church history, there were many groups that were heretical, and many of them that went under the name Gnostic. Gnostic is a very broad term, and they believed all sorts of crazy things, but there was one thing upon which all Gnostics could agree, and it was this, God and flesh do not meet. God and flesh cannot touch. The unknowable, ineffable God could never be incarnate. And here, we have to declare that the testimony of the New Testament disagrees, especially the prologue of John's Gospel. It was, it is, perfectly incompatible with the fundamental doctrines of Gnosticism. But at the same time, the Gnostics liked high-minded things. They liked highly poetic style. They generally liked the writings of the Apostle John. So it seems, I'll speculate, that they had a choice to make here. They either changed their doctrine or change John's text. And really, it's not so much a speculation because Eusebius reports that they chose the latter option, to change, to correct the text of God's word. And we have no reason to doubt the testimony of Eusebius. Westcott and Hort did. They, of course, were the architects of the modern reconstructed New Testament. And when fellow critics would raise the objection saying, no, 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 monogenes theos is a Gnostic term. That's a Gnostic term that arose from corrupt Alexandrian texts. They quickly counter, and they were able to quickly counter with this. No such evidence exists. We have no such evidence. Now, maybe they didn't, but we do. We do now. 
definitive evidence was discovered in 1945 in the Nag Hammadi Library in Upper Egypt. In the Gnostic title, titled Trimorphic Protonoia, we read this. Then the perfect son revealed himself to his eons who originated through him, and he revealed them and glorified them and gave them thrones and stood in the glory with which he glorified himself. They blessed the perfect son, the Christ, the only begotten God. Now, an eon, by the way, is an order of spirit or spiritual rank that emanates from God in the Gnostic system. And the text goes on to name several such eons, but it comes to this notable conclusion. Armadon, Nusanios, Armazel, etc., all these eons. Now, those eons were begotten by the God who was begotten, the Christ. And these eons received, as well as gave, glory. Thus, the Gnostics drove a wedge between the eternal Logos in John 1.1 1, 1, and this only begotten God in John 1.18. If this is indeed the origin of the Monogenes Theos reading, then its intent was clearly to deny the eternal deity of Christ, not to defend it. And here's the bottom line. Here's the theological crisis. If you allow one God to be begotten, there is no reason why many more may not be. You might even end up with a panoply of gods, like the ancient Greeks and Romans and Gnostics. Now, whether the variant reading Monogenes Theos did originate with the Valentinian Gnostics might continue to be debatable, but that the phrase, only begotten God, was a historically attested Gnostic reading is now beyond debate. Furthermore, that this odd reading was known to and officially rejected by our fathers in the faith is equally undeniable. Consider the creeds. A very compelling argument for the quios reading, the sun reading, is this, that those who were closest to the evidence and who actually engaged in the original debates, they received and adopted the quios reading as authentic. All the earliest controversies in the church were over the doctrine of of the Trinity, and of the Incarnation. The big questions were, did God truly become man? Was Jesus the eternal Logos? Was he the Son of God by eternal generation? Are the Father and the Son indeed consubstantial or of one substance? Those were the questions, and the church, our church, looked to John 1.18 for its answer, and they even adopted it officially in creedal form. We believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of the Father before all worlds. And yes, the Greek term there is monogene. That's the first council of Constantinople. Every generation of believers since has confessed Jesus Christ as monogenes weos, and the overwhelming evidence supports this confession as being perfectly biblical. Yet here we are. And that's the point of this conference. Here we are in the current year, and the phrase has been stricken from most modern versions. Now, I want to suggest two possible reasons to close. First would be undue allegiance to minority readings. Undue allegiance to minority readings. No matter how many manuscripts we have, no matter how much evidence of actual use in the ancient church is presented and proven, reasoned eclectics seem always to side with minority readings. Now, one of the main reasons they do this is because they assume that older is better. But again, that particular canon of text criticism does not work with this verse because the received reading of John 1.18 is as ancient as can be. The other main reason for preferring minority readings is probably the operative one here. Difficult readings are best. Difficult readings are better. No question. Monogenes Theos is a very difficult reading. It very well may be the most difficult reading in the entire New Testament. It is probably difficult enough to be counted as heresy. But difficulty does not equal authenticity. It cannot. Think of it this way. 
The Monogenes Weos reading was equally difficult to the Gnostics, the Sun reading. So, who was more likely to smooth out the difficulty? The Christian scribes who feared God and trembled before the threat of Revelation 22, 18 to 19, or a group of insane heretics? Giving first preference to minority readings is, in my opinion, inexcusable because it's an indication that a critic has undue allegiance to the outdated canons of Westcott and Hort. And I know there will be some who cry foul on that point, say, well, we're not wed to Westcott and Hort. We've made so many discoveries since then. But you know what? That true observation, and it is true, it actually cuts both ways. Again, one of those many discoveries was the Nag Hammadi Library, which confirms the long-standing suspicion that the only begotten God reading was indeed Gnostic. Now, thankfully, and I do want to be fair to all the honest critics out there, I am very happy to report that some reasoned eclectics are now rejecting the Theos reading. For example, consider the Tyndale House Greek New Testament, it's a critical edition. It leans toward Alexandrian readings, but the received reading of John 1.18 has there been restored. We have to keep watching this front. It'll be very interesting to see which reading is adopted, finally, in the Editio Critica Maior, when it is completed. Even more interesting than that will be to see this, whether evangelical text critics will admit that they have been wrong in affording such un flinching allegiance to minority readings. Actually, while I'm no fan of the CBGM, it might actually help here as it continues to challenge some of the old canons of West Cotton Court and as it also seems to afford greater value, at least on occasion to majority readings. But that's something the critics are going to have to work through. I'm not a text critic. I said that in the introduction promo last week. I'm not a member of the guild. It's just a hobby for me. But that doesn't mean anyone should neglect my testimony because I love the word of God and I believe the word of God, like everyone who is watching I trust. So let me share one personal pastoral concern to close. I said there were two conclusions that I wanted to offer. The second reason I think the phrase only begotten son was stricken from modern versions is this. Irresponsible translation. Irresponsible translation. Even a first semester Greek student could look at the phrase monogonos theos and conclude, well, that literally means only begotten God. But most modern translations are not that honest. They will not translate it literally. Because as Dean Bergon pointed out over a hundred years ago, it's just too embarrassing. They're ashamed of their reading, and rightfully so, I say. Credo, confessional Christians, do you wanna, they don't want to hear about an only begotten God. And the modern translators know it. So what they do is they finesse their translations to avoid offense. Some, like the NIV, even take great pains so as not to appear heterodox. It reads, but the only, wait, but the one and only son who is himself God, to which we all have to say what? All that from two words? But the one and only son who is himself God from two words. That's what you call irresponsible translation. If monogenes theos is your reading, then I say own it, translate it, deal honestly with your preferred text like the New American Standard Bible did. It actually says it, the only begotten God. Anything less, anything else, in my opinion, is at least a little dishonest. The sacred duty of Bible translators is not to explain, not to finesse, not to offer commentary, but to translate inspired words from one language into another. Modern Christians should therefore no longer tolerate the kind of games that have been played and are being played with the text of Scripture. They should rather call for a return to the old ways, a return to the sacred text that was used by, edited by, received by, translated by the Church of the Living God, which is the pillar and ground of the truth. For it is only in this that we will find the inspired, infallible, and self-attesting truth that saves our souls. Namely, no man hath seen God at any time. The only begotten Son, which is in the bosom of the Father, 
he hath declared him. Amen and amen. Okay, Christian, can you hear me? You yes, sir. Right All right. Who yeah. is unmuted? unmuted. You have unmuted All right, I'm gonna, everyone. Yeah, let me uh, yeah. mute everyone again. There we go. That should work. All right, can everyone hear me? Wave your hands if you can hear me. All right, excellent. And Christian, you should be live as well. Yes. And Jeff? Uh, can you hear me? Yep. And Puyon. Yeah. Yes. All right. Now, here's what I'd like you to do, all three of you. Go ahead and introduce yourselves, what your church is, what you've served in ministry. And then after that, Christian, uh, do you have the questions? Yes. We, re we received a couple. Excellent. Yes, and after you do the introductions, just go ahead and read off question one, and then you three can deal with it. I'm going to go ahead and mute myself now. I'll, I'll make this short because uh, I, you know, we we did introductions in the introductory video, but I'm Jeff Riddle, pastor of Christ Reformed Baptist Church in Louisa, Virginia. I'm Puyan Mershahi, pastor of Providence Baptist Chapel, which is a Reformed Baptist church in Cheltenham, England. And I'm Christian McShaffrey, the pastor of Five Solas OPC in Reedsburg, Wisconsin. To the questions. Actually, I don't know if I have them. I have question number one. It says it's for the speaker. Would you say right. that the reading son in John 1.18 is thematically more consistent with the rest of the Gospel of John, where it is the son who is sent by the Father to reveal him? And, of course, we have some scriptures there from John 3, 5, 6, 8, 10, 14, and 17. Is the reading son more thematically consistent with the rest of the Gospel? I would say absolutely, without a doubt. The father-son theme is predominant in John's gospel. Jesus calls God Father twice as many times in John than in the synoptics. Also the title, ha Huios, the son, it appears more frequently in John's gospel. But there's also another thematic element that could be considered. It's the son being sent by the father. That's very common language in the gospel of John, and we read about it in chapter 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 12, 14. And this sending or the mission that the son received was, I think, explained in John 1.18. He was sent to declare the father. And that mission of the son to make known the father and his love is a recurring theme in John's narrative. We know that once Christ completed that mission, he entered back into the fellowship that he had enjoyed with his father from eternity. But then we have another aspect added, and it should not surprise us that this mission theme progressively unfolds to include the Holy Ghost and also us. John 13, verse 20, for example, says, Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that receiveth whomsoever I send receiveth me, and he that receiveth me receiveth him that sent me. So we have Father, Son, us, but only because of the Holy Spirit, of which we also read, when the Comforter is come, whom I will send unto you from the Father, even the Spirit of truth, which proceedeth from the Father, he shall testify of me, and ye also shall bear witness. So as we apply that to the debate at hand, the question is, to what do we bear witness? I mean, is it a Christian version of Hercules, or is it this one true God? Father, only begotten Son, the Holy Ghost. Now more could be said here, but I think, yes, John 1.18 is most consistent with this overarching theme of Father and Son, mission and testimony in the Gospel of John. I'll follow up just on that. And let I me mean, first of all just say, Christian, thank you so much for that presentation. I thought it was excellent. 
And uh, I, I really appreciated uh, that. You did a great job in a succinct way of summarizing things. You know, with respect to the, the, the issue of whether or not the, the reading uh, at John 118 should be uh, the, the only begotten son or the only begotten God, yes, I mean, there is a theme of sonship you know, throughout the Gospel of John. And I I recently, a couple of years ago, preached through the Gospel of John, and I think I did about 100 messages through it. And I remember it was one of the things I was struck by, you know, as as I as I was preaching through. Um, and and I, I was, as you were speaking, I was thinking about that. And um, I know when I got to John 6, 69, it's Peter's uh, confession. It's actually another, it's another passage that's textually disputed. Where the, the sonship theme is, is muted, um, in the, in the modern critical text. But Peter's confession, you know, is, and we believe and are sure that thou art that Christ, the son of the living God. And, and likewise in, um, John 11, uh, you've got the, the confession of, uh, of Martha as well, uh, confessing Christ, this is in John 11, 27. She saith unto him, Yea, Lord, I believe that thou art the Christ, the Son of God, which should come into the world. Mm. And when, when you go to uh, the end of John, you know, John uh, famously has uh, a, an explanation of its purpose, a purpose statement in John 20, uh, verse 31. But these are written that ye might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing ye might have life through his name. So the theme of the sonship of Christ is preeminent in John's gospel. And, you know, you were talking about the external evidence. And I, I did a, a Word Magazine podcast on this a couple of years ago. Um, what is it? I think it's Word Magazine 56. And I went and looked back at that again, and you, you surveyed some of it. And, um, you know, when you look at the extant Greek evidence for the, for the reading, uh, either monogenes theos or ha uh, monogenes theos, there are only eight extant Greek manuscripts that have, that witness to this. Now there's some versional evidence. It's in the, it's in the Syriac Peshitta, but, um, it's only P75, the second corrector of Sinaiticus in 33 that have ha monogenes theos. It's only P66, the original hand of Sinaiticus, Vaticanus, the original hand of Ephraim Rescriptus, and Codex L that have monogenes, monogenes theos. So it's really only a handful of manuscripts that have this in my view, spurious reading. And, um, of course, uh, Metzger in his commentary talks about the fact that, well, it's there in P75, it's there in P66. But Westcott and Horton made the decision to go with uh, Only Begotten God um, long before the papyri were ever discovered. Hmm. And it does make you wonder, you know, were they driven by an effort to undermine basically an orthodox view, an orthodox Christology that seems to be preeminent in John. And, you know, there was a lot of, uh, there, and I I don't want to go all conspiracy theory and some, sometimes KJV only in particular, you know, are, are criticized for going after Westcott and Hort. But let's face it, you know, the 19th century, there was a whole lot of um, Arianism, modern Arianism that was afoot. And and so, you know, it's it's not surprising, perhaps, that there were these efforts to, you know, contend for these readings that would undermine, um, you know, a, a, we might say a more orthodox view, Trinitarian view of the traditional reading. And as you also pointed out, I mean, interesting enough, now we've got a backlash sort of that's going on, and I, I'll, I'll stop yakking. And I, uh, you know, if you haven't gotten this little uh, book, uh, 
edited by Fred Sanders and Scott R. Swain uh, called Retrieving Eternal Generation. You know, there, recently in, there's been a, a dispute and debate uh, sort of, um, you know, about the, the concept of the eternal generation of the sun. And um, and this passage is relevant uh, for that as well. And this 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 book is a collection of articles, but there's you know one within it um, written by Charles Lee Irons called "A Lexical Defense of the Johannine Only Begotten." And at the very end of that um, of that of this chapter, he talks about the problems with the ESV's translation of John 118. And uh, he says, uh, the second problem with the ESV's translation of John 118 is that it could easily bis- be misused as a proof text for modalistic monarchianism or the Jesus only heresy of oneness Pentecostalism. If, if uh, Jesus is the only begotten God. Well, there might have been some people in the second century as well as in the 19th century who would have seen that as a primitive Christian view of, of Jesus as either, uh, you know, a, a representation of God at one point in time and a denial of the Trinitarian God and so anyways, there is a lot at stake with this theologically. And I, I think one thing, you know, I'll stop talking, related to this ongoing conversation we're going to have starting today and the next week and next week, I think the Trinity is going to come up. It's going to come up next week with First John 5, 7. Uh, it's going to come up with probably with Puyon's uh, discussion of why the, the traditional text is a preferred text for apologetics as opposed to the modern critical text. and you know, as you said, none of us are in the guild, but we're all pastors. And I think we understand uh, that the need to defend the faith and to have a, a, a text that uh, that we can preach from, we can teach from, and we can teach doctrines and defend the deity of Christ and the, the, the triune God. So um, anyways, thank you so much uh, for the presentation. I I really appreciated it. Well, you're welcome. Thanks for those thoughtful comments on the question. Puyan, did you have anything to add to that first question? Oh, we need some moderation. Oops. Let's see. I've got it. You're live, my friend. Okay. Well, thank you, um, Chris, uh, Christian, for uh, that wonderful presentation. Um, I think that those of us who have heard these things and those of you, brethren, who have uh, been listening to uh, Christian's presentation, you would see that uh, what a fundamental text this is and how serious uh, it would be to mistranslate it and I would say that the um, concentrated uh, point has been on the term for God or son uh, but also we should give due uh, concern over the translation of um, only begotten as well because for example ESV translated translates it as only but only begotten is it is what the Greek says and it is speaking of the, uh, the the nature of the person that is referred to. It is the um, begottenness of the son, and so it it um, it has with it a theological. It's not just the God or the Son that gives us the theological um, teaching here, but the begottenness or the only begottenness as well is speaking of the eternal generation of the, the um, object uh, of that uh, phrase, which is God or the Son. And God cannot be uh, generated, uh, but the Son was. The Son was given, the Scripture says. And the question, I think, that 
uh, those who hear these uh, messages should ask themselves, it's a serious question that I had to grapple with, is that who gives the editors this inspired editorial authority to choose a minority and unorthodox view of this reading? Uh, and that is quite a serious point. Who gives them the, the, this editorial authority, inspired editorial authority, that even in the uh, marginal readings, they, they um, are not honest about the, the um, volumes or the uh, sheer amount of the uh, evidence that there is manuscript evidence that 99.5% of the Greek manuscripts favor and have exactly the only begotten son reading. So who gives them the authority to choose the mind that minority reading and then give the impression that this is the right one? Um, and um, but uh, think about it on a theological point that uh, uh, Christian mentioned is that if uh, the, the God part, the deity of Jesus Christ, our Lord, was begotten in the womb of the Virgin Mary, then he is not eternally pre-existent and in that event Christ couldn't be God the Son uh, one of the three persons of the Trinity and, and here it is that we see the precision of the Old Testament prophecies for example Isaiah 9 and verse 6 where it says unto us a child is born unto us a son is given Jehovah the Son was given not born but in any case why, why follow seven manuscripts or eight manuscripts of uh, demonstrably inferior quality against the uh, over a thousand evidences. Uh, the, um, the original and therefore true reading is certainly the only begotten son. That is what I wanted to say, but, but the, the, the thought um, that who gives the inspired editorial authority uh, to those who select a minority and um, and as it has been demonstrated, unorthodox view of this reading. That's something that you have to grapple with when you come to the issue of the text. That's all I've got to say about that. Well, thank you. Chris, should we go to the second question we received here in the chat? I have a thumbs up. And it actually follows up on that question of where is the authority to establish the word of God? And this question is about evidence. It's a long question. I'll read it in full, and then we can take a few minutes and explore some of the answers that would come. Would you recommend that all manuscripts, papyri, etc., that are found, which are not included in the Textus Receptus, be ignored? Which route do you believe translators would have taken in the past if they were put in our current situation? With a high view of God's word, missing a word in any translation would be a scary thing. Thus, over time, as the later manuscripts have added materials, as removed by translations using the critical text, which were believed to be added by the incorporation of side notes and such, does that not actually strengthen the argument for the preservation of those manuscripts believed to be earlier than those found in the Textus Receptus? Long question. Uh, let me try to break it down and offer a few thoughts. Uh, thanks, by the way, for those who are watching for sending questions in advance. It gives us some time to think, but this one wasn't sent very early. It's about evidence, so let me say first of all this. I do not believe any evidence should ever be ignored by anyone. But there are problems that we face when examining and interpreting the evidence that we have. The first problem is this. No one can escape the power and influence of their own presuppositions. Big word, stated simply, what we believe affects always what we see. Now, I live up in Wisconsin near the Wisconsin Dells, and you can see their proof of the global flood and a young earth. It's carved into stone. People take tour boats to go and look at these cliff walls that have been dug out by currents of water. 
I see it and I rejoice. But the atheist, the fool, who says in his heart there is no God, due to his epistemological commitment, sees something completely different. Same evidence, different conclusion. So the first problem with evidence is this. There is no such thing as bare, naked evidence. We always bring our presuppositions to bear upon it. Now, secondly, this gets to the second part of the question about what ancient translators would do if they were put in our current situation. And I'm not entirely sure what that means, but, you know, what's our current situation? Maybe we have more evidence today than they had then. I can't grant that. The most foundational question here is this. How do we know what they had and what they didn't have? How do we know what the editors of the ecclesiastical text held in their hands? I mean, it's possible. I'm not saying it's likely, and I'm not saying it's the case, but it's possible that they had as much, if not more, manuscripts than we have today. And people are going to laugh at that suggestion, but I would encourage our listeners here to study one of the most eye-opening charts I've ever seen online. It's called How Many Manuscripts Have Been Destroyed? And you can find it at textusreceptusbibles.com, and it records just a part of the body of evidence that has been destroyed by war, and it is unthinkable to think about how much we've lost over the past five to a thousand years. So maybe our fathers in the faith had as much, if not more, than we do today. But more to the point is this. When you think about evidence, counting straps of paper is not textual criticism, and that's not science. I very much like what Dr. Gurry said in a video a while back. He said, we only need one good one. That is, one good manuscript to have a good text. And with that observation, I completely agree. <laughs> Last part of the question I can't answer because I can't grant the assumption that there was a tendency of scribes to add material to the text of Scripture or even to let it sneak in. I mean, the questioner admitted that the work of of text criticism or translation is a scary thing, and I agree. So I don't think that any Christian, any saint who fears God, would be careless or flippant or subversive in their sacred work. On the other hand, as Eusebius reported, the heretics had no scruples at all in altering the sacred text. So what that tells me is this. Ancient can't mean authentic. Earlier cannot mean better, because... But as Ken Ham would say, you know, were you there? Were you there? This is all speculation. So it's a good question. It's a deep question. I'd invite others to weigh in on it because that's about all I would have to say. I've, I've said in some discussions with um, people who are practitioners of modern text criticism and reason eclectics, you know, that, yeah, we're not afraid of the evidence. They, they would like to say, oh, you just want to bury your head in the sand and you, 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 you don't want to. Uh, you don't want any historical study of early Christian documents and so forth. I mean, I don't, I don't think that at all. I mean, uh, I, I, my perspective would be something like, uh, you know, Francis Schaeffer, who wrote about dealing with science and creation and so forth that you were talking about earlier, I think in a book that was called No Final Conflict. I just believe that in the end that whatever evidence is uncovered, it's not going to be something that's going to disprove the uh, the authority and the authenticity of the confessional text or the traditional text, um, even even with regard to this passage, um, you know, uh, in the original edition, first edition of Metzger's textual commentary, I think you pointed out um, one of the five members of the committee, the five people who were at that time creating the modern critical text, um, Alan Wittgren did not agree with the monogamous theos reading. And uh, in the first edition of the textual commentary, there's a, there's a minority report in which he disagrees. And he said, and they gave, you know, they rated the readings and they gave the monogamous theos reading a B reading. He said it should have been a D reading. And he didn't argue that it was a theological interpretation. He said it was simply a transcriptional error that related to the nomina sacra. 
So, um, the, you know, the word theos in the, in the nomina sacra would be theta sigma and huios, son, would be upsilon sigma. And he said, you know, someone just had, you know, uh, monogenes huios with an upsilon sigma and they inappropriately copied it as uh, monogenes um, theos, theta sigma. And so, you know, he said it was just a simply a transcriptional error that resulted in this minority reading. And then it was it was, um, you know, not copied and not continued in the dominant tradition. So that might be an example of somebody looking at the external evidence and actually using it to reinforce or affirm the traditional reading or giving a plausible explanation for how these minority readings developed, as opposed to championing these these minority readings that were either introduced for theological reasons or for out of transcriptional error and saying that they're the authentic text. So there's a place there's a place for the study of manuscripts and so forth. I just don't want those people to attempt to reconstruct the text that is used by believers and churches. Maybe what back to what Puyan said, who gives them authority to dictate to us what our text should be. And so, you know, there's a, there's a place for the study of these things, but, um, it, we're, it, we're, we're, we would have the problem. We've talked to this before. What we have now is basically anarchy with these multiple translations. They're all coming up with something different. We haven't talked about, you know, the new New American Standard Bible is going to have a completely different rendering for, um, for John 1.18. And there's even another there, there's even another aspect of this verse that we haven't talked about, and that is that the modern translations have tended to, to change uh, the, the word bosom also, and whether to come up with some kind of dynamic equivalent for that at the Father's side, or uh, apparently the, the New American Standard Bible that's coming out in 220, uh, 2020, the revision is going to say in in uh, the Father's arms. Um, so there's no end to the variations and differences and supposed improvements that some people will try to take with the text. And uh, at some point, I think we've got to build a line that says, no, don't mess with our scriptures anymore. Don't, you, you can't improve upon it. You can't you take away from it. Stop messing with our scriptures. And um, so I don't know if that uh, responds to the question, but there it is. If I may just um, add to that briefly, um, is that uh, the question was also asked about the, um, uh, if, uh, do you believe that the translators would have taken um, in the past if they were put in our current situation? Um, uh, the, the point is that we know from their writings and from what they say in the introduction to the authorized version, uh, the, lo the long edition, the, the, um, not the short edition, the two-page edition, but the, um, I think this 30-page edition of it, they make it clear that their view was a theological one concerning the text of the scriptures and also its method of translation. It wasn't based on evidence it was a theological one derived from the, the, the revelation of God, of himself. So that the view of the doctrine of providential preservation of the scripture wasn't coming out of the Westminster Confession of Faith. It was not, the, it, the Westminster Confession had not been produced yet, but they already had that doctrine. Um, and so this is not, this was not something new to them or, uh, and, um, and so they would lead, uh, th that view of theirs would lead, if they were alive today, to, to hold on consistently with that theological view. Uh, if it is followed, uh, following that reason, uh, that this doctrine is birthed from a commitment to the revelation of God about himself and about his word and not from an evidential and secular science, science viewpoint. 
uh, again, it's not about counting um, how many um, manuscripts we have in favor uh, of us or, or not. Uh, it is the, the doctrine of a scripture. It's a theological concept. Um, and the, the ultimate authority, again, um, uh, it, um, it, um, it, is a, it is a presupposition that the Lord keeps his word. And, uh, and um, the, the question that always bothered me, uh, uh, has God left his church? in the dark without a complete scripture or do we have to um, scratch in the dark and scratch in the dirt try to find and it's always um, we are in this balance uh, of, of uncertainty and James tells us in James 1 and verse 8 of a man who is double minded uh, and James says that a double minded man is unstable in all his ways and that is what I find sincerely speaking, um, of the way that the textual critics of our day uh, are dealing with the scripture. They don't know. And this, is, this, is, this has to be um, something, and I, again, I say it with love and sincerity, it is um, they are not certain if we have the word of God. Any text is under question. Any word is under question. It all depends on what may come. Tomorrow they might find something in some old library. Um, so that goes against the, the presuppositional view of the text of a scripture. Um, and they must borrow. We must borrow um, the, the worldview that says that... Uh, that um, uh, speaks against the Bible self-authenticating uh, view. Um, and so, um, again, I, I would a ask you who are listening and watching this to really think about your theological position, your presuppositional position over this matter, uh, rather than evidential position. Ev evidential position is very uncertain because it it um, it uh, the future is uncertain, um, and the minds and the hearts of those who are investigating and who are making the decisions in some uh, in some gatherings and back offices somewhere, uh, it is very uncertain, mm -hmm. and their theological position and the state of their heart before the Lord. So um, that's something I want to just. Two, two follow-ups to that, you know, I, the the Charles Lee Irons article on uh, defending the traditional translation of monogenesis as only begotten, he makes the point that, um, and, and Chris Christian alluded to this in his presentation too, that it was only in the 19th century that you had um, you had this idea put forward of that that monogenes uh, didn't come from the verb genao to beget but it came from the verb genomai to be or to become and it became you know all the rage to begin to to understand monogenes as unique um and he makes the point i think it's a great argument in there that that uh that that's kind of a false dichotomy between the two origins because actually Ganao and Genomai have a common root. Right. And um and he makes a great point in that article about how um you know the the term um monogenes means only begotten. <laughs> you know, he gives countless examples of how it's it it doesn't mean unique or only um, in the context of, of how it's used in the Gospel of John and, and other places in the New Testament. And so we had a fad that came along for about 100, 150 years, where all of a sudden monogenes was the unique or the only. And, and actually now that's beginning to tail off to a certain degree. And um, so as Puyan was saying, if we don't have presuppositions and we don't have a theological framework, 
we're vulnerable to these trends and fads that come and go. Um, and that might be with respect to translation. It might be with respect to the text. And so, so, so if we are conservative, traditional Christians, you know, that means we're trying to conserve something. We're committed to a tradition. And, um, how is it that we have evangelicals who aren't trying to conserve the tradition but are attempting to undermine? And I notice it's in the chat several people were saying rightly, well, that's the way the academy works. You don't get tenure by writing papers and dissertations about how the tradition is right and it ought to be maintained and upheld. You know, you have to come up with something novel, something new, and you don't you don't sell a new translation with a new and improved, you know, rendering. You know, that makes it apparently, you know, more more marketable um, as opposed to, no, it's the it's the same old translation. It's the same old text that has been preserved and doesn't need to be tampered with and changed and and tinkered with. Uh, every couple of years. So I, I think probably most of us in this group having this conversation, you know, it's kind of preaching to the choir, but, but, um, maybe it's good just to reinforce it among ourselves at least. Well, Jeff, I have a, a non-choir question that came in in the email and it's actually, um, a challenge. What about Hebrews 11:17? Doesn't it prove the unique reading? Um, I skipped this in my presentation, but um, I don't mind talking about it probably for our last five to ten minutes, and then we'll wrap things up. Hebrews 11, verse 17, By faith Abraham, when he was tried, offered up Isaac, and he that had received the promises offered up his only begotten son. So how can, I assume the question is, how can Isaac be called a monogenes when he obviously had a brother. And the argument there is that it probably must mean unique. He's a special son. And this has been a common objection um, for a long time. I mean, John Calvin had to address this in his commentary before any of us were even thought of being born. And he just explains it in terms of, you know, after Ishmael's apostasy, he was cast out of the family as one dead. Um, thus making the true son as if he was the only begotten. I think that's a perfectly reasonable explanation. Um, but if that's not, feel free to send me another email. Um, he is the only begotten son. Isaac is the only begotten because Ishmael was reprobated, excommunicated, and he had no place amongst the family after that. I agree with your interpretation. Yeah, it's it's a standard interpretation. I, yeah. So how about for our last five minutes? Uh, we're, we're speaking to the choir and singing with the choir. The comments have been very entertaining. Let's speak to those who are hearing these things for the first time and who are not entirely persuaded. What is our purpose in bringing them up, and what would we like them to do with this presentation? That question is to us, or you're saying, Christian? Well, we do have to wrap it up, so I thought maybe we could make a evangelistic or apologetic appeal to close. Hmm. Well, we could tie it into this. Uh, we have one question that I skipped over in the chat, and maybe this would be a good tie-in with a closing statement. I wonder about how the switch to theos keeps out the sunness out of the text. So it's the age-old question, even if there is some discrepancy here in John 1.18, we have the sunness testified throughout the New Testament. So how does the loss of this one particular word, whether it be through text or translation, impact the gospel in any way? Is this just a scholarly uh, matter of interest, or is it truly evangelical? And... For me, you know, I, I can start here. I do think it's a matter of evangelical trust, that if God has revealed to us his word 
And if the only begotten has come to make known the Father, then we need to receive that testimony. And perhaps the question is correct. We don't lose sonness if we adopt the monogenes theos reading necessarily, but we add something. We add something foreign to the testimony of Scripture and something that's been regarded as heretical since the ecumenical creeds, that there is the concept of begotten gods out there. We confess only one true God, Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. And to introduce the concept of begottenness of deity um, I find it loathsome and unacceptable. And if somebody is really interested in finding out what is the theological import, spend some time researching the variant reading and see the kind of groups that argue most intently for it. You'll probably be surprised. I would, I would just say, you know, if the question is, you know, do we do we necessarily have to, can't we do we have to defend this this particular variant um can't we you know argue for the eternal generation of the son from other passages yes we can obviously you know we could look at Matthew 5 17 18 Christ saying you know that that every jot and tittle of the word is important and that that it won't pass away and so every Every part of God word, God's word is significant. No, we're not dependent upon this verse alone to uh, construct our Christology, but it's still part of, a part of God's word, and it's a part that's been preserved, and every portion is uh, significant. So, And we'll probably talk about this next week with respect to the Trinity and the Coma Ioannaeum. Yeah, can the Trinity be Trinity be defended without the, the verse? Yes, but um, that doesn't downplay this downgrade the significance of that verse uh, as a proof text uh, for the, the doctrine of the Trinity. And I would say the same thing with respect to this verse for Christology, for the doctrine of the, the eter eternal generation of the Son, um, for affirming uh, that that the Lord Jesus Christ is the only begotten. A son of the Father, um, so uh, it, it's not a, a, an insignificant matter, and I, I'm concerned about people who are willing to give up um, defense of one portion of, of Scripture supposedly to defend, um, you know, the rest of the uh, of the doctrines of Scripture, and so um, I think we're justified in. in and defending the, the reading that, that is here. And it seems like actually, you know, with respect to, you know, the Tyndall House Street New Testament affirming now the traditional reading, it seems like this is one that, uh, where the momentum is on our side for reclaiming this verse. And, and, and in fact, it, it, it seems to be proving itself to be an evidence, I think, of the preservation of scripture. Somehow, I mean, when, when people who, who affirm reason eclecticism are now affirming this traditional reading, which had fallen out of favor for about a hundred years, it's some evidence, isn't it, of, I think, the providential work of God. So, brothers, our goal was to go one hour and 15 minutes, and we just came to that time. And I one of the... I'll say one thing. Go uh, ahead. If you don't mind. In terms of encouraging my brethren who may view this and you're still thinking you're still wondering and you wonder will just one word uh, be such an important issue is it so critical for us to be so picky at this and i would encourage you to um, come before the lord with your open bibles in your own devotions as you come to worship god in privacy of your own home and before the Lord and you go through in your mind the text of Isaiah that we are to tremble at the word of God and that means that we tremble at every jot, every tittle every part of the word of God, every word is pure and I, I know that you believe it I know that in your heart of heart, the Lord, if you are one of his, the Lord has revealed that to you. And God's word is precious to you. And 
Therefore, you, you, in your heart of heart, you tremble before it. And that makes every word so important to you. You want to cherish it. You want to drink it up. You want to feed from it. And therefore, and then when you think about the fact of the Logos, Christ himself, who is the incarnate word, you don't want to miss any part of him. You want to have everything of Christ. It, it goes back to Christ himself. And, uh, and, and think about that, my friends, and think about what has been said. Uh, think about our presuppositions as we come to the word of God. And, and remember that we are not talking about words such as and, is. We are not talking about connecting words uh, per se. We are talking about critical words. And they are not just ones and twos. There are many hundreds of words. That, uh, that are theological, and they're all part and parcel of our doctrine of Christ, uh, which is then connected to the doctrine of the Word of God. And, uh, and, and as soon as we have error and unstability introduced to any part of the text, we then have instability, or um, it destabilizes the whole concept of a scripture and and so I, I encourage you and and the fact that I think how dare I to tamper with just one word of God I must give an account to even just one word one syllable if it is tampered with so my friends I, I encourage you to consider these things take it seriously and uh, the Lord will bless you in your study I hate to add anything else because that was that was Puyan's a beautiful statement. I I appreciate the your calling us to to see this as a devotional. It's a matter of our piety. It's a matter of our faith in Christ. And it, it struck me as you were talking that you know one of the one of the uh, statements that's made by people in the reconstruction side the reason the eclectic side from the evangelicals is well none of these issues with text affects any cardinal doctrines well john 118 explodes that textual variations affect cardinal doctrines this is the doctrine of Christ. This is the doctrine of the Trinity. This is the doctrine of the Incarnation. This is the doctrine of the eternal generation of the Son, not to mention the doctrine of the preservation of God's Word and the doctrine of the canon of Scripture. And I mean, you said it beautifully. Um, this is not insignificant. This is highly significant uh, for God's people. Thank you. I guess I'd just like to say in closing that thank you for that presentation, Christian. That was amazing, especially with the information in there. And Jeff, could you go ahead and hold up that book again so people can get a clear screenshot of it if they want? Retrieving the Eternal Generation. All righty. Excellent. And I would like to just go ahead and if we could close out in prayer and bring it to a close. Christian, would you lead us? Absolutely. Brothers, let's pray. Almighty and ever-living God, we confess and worship you as the only true God, Father, Son, and Holy Ghost, one God most blessed forever and ever. We thank you for the comfort and the hope that we have in the Holy Gospel, that while no man has seen God at any time, the only begotten Son of God has come into this world that we might have life and life more abundant. We thank you also for the church of our Lord Jesus Christ in all times and all places. And we thank you for how well she has served as steward of the divine oracles. And we pray, O oh God, that our conversation today would touch many hearts and open many hearts to the truths of inspiration, infallibility, 
the self-attesting authority of Scripture and the importance of weighing modern translations against the things that we hold dear to our hearts. We pray, O oh God, that you would establish the work of our hands as we continue in our several tasks and vocations. And we thank you that while we are here meeting online, we will someday meet face-to-face -face in brotherly fellowship in the eternal realms of heaven, mm. where we will all fall down before the only begotten, before the Lamb who is slain, before the Son who bore our sins on the cross and who was raised for our justification. Send your Holy Spirit into each one of our lives that we might stay encouraged, diligent, and applied to the tasks that you have been so gracious in assigning to us. All these things we ask in the wonderful, strong, and holy name of Jesus Christ, our Lord, by the power of his Holy Spirit. Amen. 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 All right. I think this is a good way to end it. And I would just like to thank each one of you three for being with us today. And Christian, thank you again for the presentation. And for all of you out there who joined us, and for those who will see that as we uh, put up the videos throughout the week, I hope you all have a blessed week and that you find this as profitable as I have. And next week, we have Dr. Jeffrey Riddle's presentation on 1 John 5, 7 and how it affects the Trinity. I'm looking forward to that.